So hello, everyone. My name is Peter Fritz, and I teach here in the Department of Religious Studies. And on behalf of Tom Landy, the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, and my religious studies colleague, Matt Egemeyer, welcome to today's lecture by Professor Cyril O'Regan. It is an enormous pleasure to introduce you to my teacher, mentor, and friend, Cyril O'Regan. He is the Whisking Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame, where I met him 12 years ago. I've been his student ever since. That hasn't stopped. All the books in the world could not contain everything that I have learned from him. Cyril is a prolific author. He has published five books, and by my count, has written at least two others, whose publication the theological community eagerly awaits. His research focuses on various themes, including Trinity, Christology, Gnosticism, apoco apocalypticism, mysticism, and the relationship between philosophy, literature, and theology. His most recent book, I brought a prop. His most recent book, The Anatomy of Misremembering, von Balthasar's Response to Philosophical Modernity, Volume 1, Hegel, chronicles how the Swiss Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar sets up theological resistance against philosopher G.W.F. Hegel's comprehensive and comprehensively flawed account of Christian theology, practice, and life. Though the book is intellectually demanding and philosophically and theologically technical, it raises basic questions to which all of us can relate. Who in our modern world are the dominant storytellers? How can I live authentically when the modern world's dominant storytellers often get the story wrong? And what will it take to get the story right to set us back on our feet? Surely these are significant questions and Cyril treats them beautifully. One can hardly read a page of Cyril's writing without recognizing his towering intellect, deep learning, and capacious insight, and Catholic faith to boot. Likewise, one can hardly spend a moment with Cyril without experiencing his exceptional warmth, effusive kindness, and peerless generosity. Today's talk is one of the Deitchman family lectures on religion and modernity. Thanks to the generosity of John Deitchman, class of 1970, and his family. This series explores the place of religious and spiritual life in a modern world that is sometimes at odds with faith, other times in search of it, and always at work reshaping it. Cyril's lecture, titled The Gift of Modernity, promises to treat all these things. Please join me in welcoming him to Holy Cross. Yeah, I do, I do know about it. First, thank you to Peter. Uh, it is the case that one of those pleasures, and it is an odd pleasure, that a professor can have is that a once upon a time student is, despite what Peter says, no longer a student. And the same can be said uh, for another ex Notre Damer, Matt Egmar, uh, who's also part of the welcoming party. Uh, I want to thank the McFarland Center and Tom Landry in particular uh, for the invitation. I want to thank you for turning up, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, whether sort of requested or coerced. Uh, you are here now, whoever. Uh, so uh, we have an hour, hour and a half. Uh, I am Irish, so uh, I will stay here until the rot rotten eggs or tomatoes come. So um, you needn't worry so that after 40 minutes I'm going to cut out. Um, that the, I think the wheel and woe might start at this point since I, I do not seem to know, so they know how time goes. And I should also point out, actually, I don't wear a watch, so that's the other discomforting thing. This handout is your friend. 
this handout uh, will make uh, this talk bearable. Um, we cannot make it memorable sort of without going through it, and we'll see sort of whether we can make it memorable. But it is actually addressed to you who are young here. That is, it is addressed to you uh, undergraduates. Now, if it looks as if after a while it can't be addressed to me, I'm telling you it's for you. So uh, keep that in mind that I have not made the category error that uh, you happened to be here, uh, but you are not the audience. You are the audience for this paper. The gift of modernity keeps this. We're starting with, with an introduction. Let me begin this talk with a distinction. It takes just a little education, okay, perhaps an education that involves a nod to Plato and perhaps a wink in the direction of modern French philosophy to realize that there are at least two senses of gift currently in operation. There is the ordinary straightforward sense of gift being something good, so that when someone uses the phrase, the gift of modernity, even someone as obviously shifty as I, you have good reason to believe that modernity, whatever that is, is being construed positively as an unqualified good, bringing benefits to us that are plausibly different in extent to what was provided in the pre-modern world, and perhaps also different in kind, the gift of modernity. The referendum would then be on. You could either accept or reject the claim. Acceptance or rejection might simply be an index of personality. You are, are a sunny type and well disposed to the commonplace dictates of how wonderful it is for us to enjoy such material comfort and to have such a fabulous menu of choice in and through which to construct a life. Or you're more brooding and choleric, not likely to take things at face value. You are more inclined to denounce modernity as a sham, a lovely surface hiding the shame of a systemic ugliness and the huge price paid for the would-be crystal palace of reason, progress, and equality. Hopefully, however, since so-called high civilizations, we're supposed to be one, and certain colleges tend to require reason-giving. Yea and nay should consist of more than an expression of instinct, even if it turns out that the best we are capable of is after a minor 19th century philosopher, A.J. Bradley, that really thinking turns out to be providing bad reasons for things that we already believe on instinct. Now, shortly, we the royal we, I, will get to description of both positive and negative phenomena that might encourage voting yay or nay. Before we get there, I should put on the table another, less straightforward sense of gift, which has been brought forward in modern continental philosophy and is especially prominent in the French trickster, Jacques Derrida. Now, this slippery fellow expostulates on the doubleness of gift by drawing attention to the doubleness of the German giften, which means both cure and poison, which you don't need to know this, but of course you're here anyway. This also translates the Greek pharmakon, which also has the same double meaning. Okay, but of course, if we think of it, or if you think of it, this is not quite as recondite as it might appear. After all, most pharmaceuticals are poisons, even if targeted poisons. Although it can and does function at the more reflective second-order level, this second sense is just as intuitive as the first. For instance, any one of us could get upset that a particular person bought us a Christmas or birthday gift. For instance, for even if exchange is not intended, we feel the oppressiveness of its burden. The gift is 
structurally ambiguous. That the gift is at once a benefit and a burden bears upon the reception of modernity. Now, besides straight-up affirmation and negation of modernity being proffered as a gift, there is this much more ambiguous estimate in which there is a valorization of the goods, which it would make no sense to return, including your phones, and at the same time, fundamental worries about the cost of these goods on the level of the individual, relations between individuals and society. Now, while not doubting that all three of these positions function oftentimes at the level of immediate intuition or perception, that is, my assumption is that each one of you here have some immediate perception as to what the world you live in now, what it's like, how it impacts you, and how you validate it. But besides straight-up affirmation and negation of modernity, being proffered as a gift, there is this more ambiguous estimate in which there is the valor valorization of goods, which, as I said, makes no sense to return, at the same time, fundamental worries about the costs of these goods, as I said, at the level of individual relations and society. Now, we're not doubting that all three of these positions function oftentimes at the level of immediate intuition. I want to say, I want to provide examples of philosophical theories in which these fundamental options are argued for and also isolate the fundamental postures of Christianity that break fundamentally along the same lines. Yes, no, I don't know, maybe. But before we do, we do that, let's christen them. Let's christen the positive response, the negative response, and the ambiguous response. I propose we call the unreflective and in due course, reflective, it's those people who justified, yesers, let's call them cheerers. The unreflective and reflective naysayers, let's call them weepers. And with a nod to teenage pulp fiction, and fantasy fiction in particular, unreflective and reflective ambiguators, can't make up the minders, shadow seers, the seers are shadows. I would advise just a moment of introspection and then make a guess at the person who is sitting alongside you this evening. Cheerer, weeper, shadow seer. Section two, phenomenology, three kinds of pre-reflective response. So to give some experiential traction to these different points of view, let me draw attention to some positive and negative phenomena that thinkers of modernity are likely to avert to and either, on the one hand, to so privilege one or other as to be champions or cheerleaders of modernity, or violently anti-modern or weepers, and perhaps, on the other hand, to see the evidence as ambiguous and cutting simultaneously in different directions and, just, and thus be shadow seers. Now, if anyone in the audience were inclined to be a cheerer, he or she might be inclined, that's you, you might be inclined to avert to some of the following phenomena. The rise of science, you could point to. The tremendous advantages conferred on people by technology, both in reducing manual labor and opening up unheard of prospects of communic communication through, of course, various media, internet above all, the instant communication with family, colleagues, friends, who might want to see that you are buying avocados in the store. And anyone who friends you, or you find on Facebook, or follows you on Twitter, or relatedly, you, one of you, uh, might point to the advances in medicine, diagnosis, treatment, immunology, epidemiology, and the concomitant reduction in infant mortality. Does it sound like you now? Massive increase in lifespan. Perhaps also increase access to education, fairly relevant here, I think. The benefits of freedom of expression, which you clearly didn't have in terms of you were forced to come to the lecture. And, and with freedom also for self-determination, which clearly is not sort of what happens at Holy Cross. That is freedom for and not necessarily freedom from. You might also want to add to a cheerer a heightened sense 
of being a citizen of the world. Take it part of the protocol of an education, Holy Crosses. You've been made to be a citizen of the world. I haven't checked sort of last time, but I imagine it's not too much different than Notre Dame. So a heightened, you are a citizen of the world. You certainly have a deep sense of justice, both for individuals, uh, communities, or for individuals, communities, and for small nations. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. I've left out much, but I still think you get the point. I think I've given enough information for a cheerer to recognize himself or herself. Correlatively, if anyone in the audience is a weeper, and I don't really want to hear you just now, thank you very much, he or she might list the following. The rise of science cannot be separated. Obviously, I have to now deepen my voice. It's going to be much more lugubrious. Cannot be separated from the noxious claim that scientific knowing provides the model of all knowing, and specifically how we understand, judge ourselves, our relations, history, what is the good of society and the world. Rather than being ahead, we are now behind our pre-modern ancestors who felt knowing was an analogical term and was human and domain-specific. The weeper might add the split engineered within society and ourselves because of the hypertrophy, the exaggeration of reason at the expense of everything else, and the hell that is, is to be paid by the overcompensation of the irrational. And lament loudly, the phenomenon of a head without a body, or a body without a head, and the irony of problem-solving reason awash in seas of pornography, which, of course, none of that is untrue. There we say it, and it needs to be said, the weeper is not fooled at all by the emergence of technology. I think your phone is ringing. It cannot be separated from industrial complex that makes war so devastating and so likely and the despoliation of the environment to fulfill energy needs. Of course, I didn't know you were teaching this course, but now I'm back to my friends again. Of course, there is the scourge of capitalism and its man-made poverty and the various forms of colonization of the third world, political, economic, cultural, in which justice is set aside and others' freedom is trampled on. I could say a lot more but this will suffice as a preliminary orientation. Without mechanically going through the procedure of inverting everything affirmed by the cheer, weepers in the audience, weepers in the audience should recognize themselves and look for allies, perhaps for minority or at least club status. I'm only saying that you're not the majority, although your passion probably makes up for it. The third view which votes neither yea nor nay, or votes yea and nay simultaneously, senses a mixture of all of the above phenomena, feels the, feels the pluses and minuses and is pulled in contrary directions. This is the plight of the shadow seer, probably some shadow seers around here, who, if in one sense cannot make up, she cannot make up her mind, in another sense experiences her mind flooded with contrary perceptions. Science and technology is incredible, and yet marked by ambiguity, which elicits ambivalence. Enhanced communication bedeviled by a problematic lack of substance. The paradoxical reduction and creation of poverty. An unparalleled ecological consciousness that goes hand in hand with unparalleled carelessness regarding the earth. Advances in freedom matched by new forms of unfreedom and addiction greater respect for women and the, dig and the dignity of children, and rampant exploitation in sex, trafficking, and child pornography. Again, I could add more ambiguous phenomena, but again, I suspect I said enough that you can recognize yourself as a shadow seer that you are. But now I have truly, this is why you came to the talk, or why people force you to come to the talk, I have wonderful news for you. I have wonderful news for all, you, all of you, all you cheerers, weepers, and shadow seers, I, me, professor at Notre Dame, I can provide you a deep historical background, provide you with new, interesting, and influential friends. In short, give you a very, very venerable pedigree. 
It's worth postponing the weekend for that, I think. It's quite clear to anyone who has any knowledge of the intellectual horizon of modernity that significant thinkers have supplied arguments and justifications for cheerers, weepers, and shadow seers, even if in the end I want to suggest that the arguments supplied to support shadow seers really are the most intrinsically interesting. I say this because I am convinced that this is the group that seems to be dealing with the widest range of phenomena. It's also the most interesting when it comes to understanding the state of religion, and Christianity in particular, in the complex and befuddling and befuddled modern world. So though I was trained as a philosopher, I am a theologian, so sooner or later Christianity has to come into it. But I take it that's not totally objectionable in this Catholic university. So. Now what I'd like to do is, I'd like to um, talk to number three on your handout. That is, I want to talk about those philosophers and theologians who offer very sophisticated arguments justifying you as a cheerer. The cheerer, some of you, is able to find both justification and solace in the very complex ideological apparatus of the Enlightenment, which starts in Europe, we can say, early 17th century. Although at the same time, we might have to say that most current apologists for modernity were made possible by much finer minds than they are themselves. Our thoughts, often, are simply the fumes and echoes of original thoughts, which have become so widely disseminated that and which we find ready at hand and to which we are captive. Often so that we think about sort of uh, their brave new ideas, but actually there are not too many new ideas at all. Most of them sort of are reheats. Uh, so much of enlightenment is a reheat, uh, but other ideas are reheats too. Of course, the enlightenment, that is when modernity begins, let's say it's three, almost 400 years old, and the three or four hundred years old, I'm not giving you a history lesson, the three or four hundred years have made you, you, and made me, me. In other words, you, you really sort of, uh, you, what you might like to do is like, like, like cutting a tree and trying to find sort of you know, where, where in the tree sort of you're going to find yourself. Where sort of is the line in which sort of that particular moment in history made you, made us, the modern people that we are. So I said, the Enlightenment allows a different allows a number of different emphasis and tonalities. So let me simplify something. So simplifying matters greatly. We might say that there are three emphasis and tonalities woven into the complex fabric of modernity, or the Enlightenment in particular, that we might want to identify, and the States doesn't get into it, as English, French, and German. I'm Irish, I suppose, so you guys are so simply the end result of everything in the USA. The English Enlightenment cannot be solely identified with Locke, John Locke. There is, after all, Bacon's apocalyptic sense of the value of science and the abolition of all shibboleths, and there is Newton's singular performance of the mat physics conjunction and the principia to be taken into account. Still, I don't know sort of whether you know of John Locke. I don't know whether you've read of John Locke. If you've read John Locke, I'm sure he bored you to hell. Uh, but the thing about it is that um, boring and being unimportant are not the same thing. It can be boring and important. I have some bad news for you. Or maybe good news for you, depending. Still, in his separation of church and state, his articulation of tolerance, you recognizing yourself now? And his insistence that religions indulge in rational self-pleasing as well as the judgment that the only good religion is a religion that believes little, and even that not fervently. These are structural features of our modern world, and I dare say they're as familiar to you as an umbrella. On the French side, there is the education regime promoted by the, philosoph the philosophers that generate dictionaries and encyclopedias and the recommendation of the abolition of political, cultural, and religious realities that lacked rational justification. And from that quarter also, the French Quarter, long before the 20th century, we get naturalism and materialism. And in the 18th century, Germany, we find the great Immanuel Kant, who will be returning to us like a good or bad penny, 
who decreed that to be free, that's some bad news for you for the weekend, to be free is to be responsible. I think he sounds like, sounds like your parent. To be a citizen is to be international. No, he sounds like Notre Dame. And that moral reason is the final arbiter not only with respect to philosophical discourse, but with re regard to religious discourse and even more particularly Christian discourse. All sounds so helpful, right? But in the end, think about it. You're playing a game. The most powerful person in the game is the referee. Who is the referee? If morality is the referee with respect to religion, morality wins. Religion loses and loses big. Arguably, if not necessarily the best known chair of modernity, so I may be introducing you to someone, the someone I'm introducing you now is Jürgen Habermas. I suspect sort of if you are taking the course you should have taken, sort of which is on capitalism, these people invited me. I now have sort of to raise them up. Um, you might sort of have heard of Jürgen Habermas, and if you haven't, sort of know this is the introduction. So arguably, if not necessarily the best-known chair of modernity, then the one with the most venerable pedigree is Jürgen Habermas, whose exceptionally long intellectual career, that happens with Germans, they have very long intellectual careers, uh, has been devoted to the Enlightenment project. Habermas grounds the Enlightenment project mainly but not exclusively in Immanuel Kant. He's German after all, he's going to prefer the Germans. However, he also takes on board other ideas generated throughout the Enlightenment, especially views regarding religion as dangerously recalcitrant and obscurantist, and thus a net retarder of the Enlightenment that grounds democracy. Now, there's no need here to go into the details of this project or the shifts of perspective over the course of a long, distinguished career. In this talk, I am, after all, in the dirty business of reducing him to a type. Habermas is not so insensible to reality that he believes that modernity has fully demonstrated his value. He thinks that um, there are real life and also ideological challenges. The most obvious real life challenges are the return of nationalisms and the emergence of Islam as an alternate polity. The most obvious philosophical challenges to be met are the philosophical refusals in modernity of the goods of reason and self-determination. After all, you can certainly refuse it. Why not, why not be irrational? Speaking to the latter, for Habermas, Nietzsche has classic status in this regard. And Heidegger uh, is at best nietzsche light. French post-structuralism fares even worse, which features uh, Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault. Uh, he believes to be largely parasitic on German thought. There's no chauvinism involved, and also significantly inferior to it. Habermas feels constrained to answer both Nietzsche and Heidegger by recourse to the same accusation. There is a fundamental lack of moral seriousness, and of course, there's also an exhibition of intellectual laziness. So if you're a rationalist, you simply are lazy and uh, you are morally irresponsible. A brief word with respect to how Habermas meets the two major social challenges. And these are hardy, by the way. Nationalism, or nationalisms, for the German political social thinker, represent a refusal to accept the essential equality of human beings and contrawise to affirm constitutive, non-moral features of human beings, ethnicity and race, as essential. Largely, Habermas takes the tack that would-be nationalism breaks out what is, breaks out what is being given, that the breakout is that it's the return of some things of which belong to a period and returns as an anachronism. Nationalism is an anachronism. It's a return from the past. Habermas does not think, with other thinkers who have read Marx, that nationalism, this is now a different definition, it's not a return of the past, but nationalism is, in significant part, a post-enlightenment construction and often dependent on concepts generated in and by the Enlightenment. 
We tend to think of nationalism, there's all this feeling, there's all this sense of community. Um, we can either say we want it back, or we can say, no, we, want, we do not want this thing to return. But actually, it could be an illusion. It was never quite like that. It's actually generated in a modernity as modernity is other. The rise of Islam puts Habermas, who's your consummate cheerer, at a loss. For him, the threat of Islam lies in nothing less than Islam being reason's other. Whereas Habermas accepts the view that enlightened reason constitutes a break from authoritarian forms of Christianity, he obviously thinks that Christianity to have, in some measure, taken enlightenment reason on board. And that the likely trajectory is that Christianity will admit of further secularization and moralization. Islam is such a surge for Habermas that in his most recent works, the German philosopher, who is usually more or less deaf to the merits of Christianity, attempts to enlist Christianity against Islam. He doesn't fully own this lack of confidence with respect to the Enlightenment, or even explain clearly why Christianity can do something the Enlightenment presumably cannot do. If we had to figure it out, if we had to do a psychoanalysis of Habermas, it probably has to do with the fact that the sheer formality of the Enlightenment as a procedural language, fairness is a procedural language, don't bias against someone, give everyone uh, what is their due, give everyone sort of a fair stake, give everyone a fair opportunity. Of course, we subscribe to that, all of us. But it is fairly formal language. We still don't know quite what we're saying when we're saying it. So it has something to do with the fact that the formality of the Enlightenment as a procedural language does not provide a motivational structure adequate to the task of resisting Islam. Perhaps he thinks Christianity does uh, and, the enlightened, and that Enlightenment reason can and should take it on board. And he is... And as he is talking this way, Habermas still does not renege fundamentally on the conviction that the Enlightenment, systemically as well as historically, represents a break with Christianity, which makes his dialogues with Benedict XVI all the more interesting. In these dialogues, Habermas's, Habermas refuses Benedict's claim that much of what is good about modernity, for example, human rights and the natural dignity of the person, is borrowed from Christianity. Pragmatics are to the fore. Christianity, if not true, and almost certainly not true on his account, might still be useful. Perhaps as Kant suggested, Christianity is a kind of exoteric form or exoteric shell of reason and can be I suppose, deputized, the sheriff and the deputy here, can be deputized to do work in the real world when reason doesn't seem to generate sufficient energy to counter its virulently obscurantist and violent other, i.e. Islam. Enlightenment doesn't seem to be able to, make, to take the fight, so now it's deputizing Christianity, which is not believed in, to take on the fight because it has a motivational structure. It is not clear whether Christianity should feel especially complimented to be treated in such an unkantian way as a mere means and not an end in itself. I could say a lot more about Habermas, but it is a story of someone who is so incredibly intelligent they hit the point they don't know what they're saying. <laughs> You've come across that experience. It might be, might be happening just now. What about the theological embrace of modernity by Christianity? Now, if there are philosophical cheerers, it is more than likely that some, perhaps many Christians in the audience are cheerers. Christians in the audience, not just you, but Christian you in the audience are cheerers of modernity. The question is whether you're a cheerer because you're a Christian. Now, there have been plenty of yeasers in modern philosophy and modern religious thought to which an intuitive cheerer can turn and adapt 
the mantle, adopt the mantle. Newman, John Henry Newman, that is, pointed out that largely due to Locke, there were far too many cheerers in the Anglican Church. This probably is not fully relevant to you. In the 18th and 19th century, which is one reason why he made his way to Rome, whom he was convinced would prevail against the lamentable cheerers. So, if you don't like cheerers, go to Rome. For Newman, these religious cheerers quite literally exemplified, literally, literally, this is John Henry Newman, who you're told like, writes brilliant prose and is incredibly civilized. He actually thinks that these cheerers are the Antichrist. No, you're not, you're not in Georgia or Mississippi now. You're in Oxford in the 19th century. They're the Antichrist. Their basic decency and sincerity led one to believe that what they offered was real Christianity, whereas in fact it was counterfeit. That's the definition of the Antichrist, counterfeit. Of course, Locke is also a major philosophical influence behind the drafting of the American Constitution and thus had for over two centuries a foothold in America as well as in Great Britain. Still, you don't need to be Locke or a log follower, to have carried forward the view of moral religion and responsible belief. That is, belief consistent with the best of modern science. In addition to that, an alternate path was opened up by Immanuel Kant, whose name has been mentioned uh, more times than not, and Friedrich Schleimacher. With Kant more interested in the match between Christianity and science and Christianity and ethics, these are fairly big things, right? and Schleiermacher interested more nearly in the match between Christianity and contemporary experience and Christianity and contemporary culture. In any event, between the two, they are responsible for much of the substance and energy of liberal Protestant theology from the late uh, 19th century through the 20th century. In addition, um, to many current Catholics, thinking pretty much like the liberal Protestant confreres, I mean, there is a melange sort of between Catholics and Protestants these days, we do have the example in the early 20th century of the movement of Catholic modernism. Thinkers such as Loisy and Tyrell argued for a church more open to the modern world in general and to be more open to biblical interpretation as a kind of science in particular. Since I intend to broach the subject of modernism again, I will only say that we don't need to go into things uh, extraordinarily well here. So now look at what we have done in three. The major philosophical example was Jürgen Habermas, and I gave you the example in theology of liberal Protestant theology. It's still alive and well. It's at Chicago. Uh, should you be interested, you can find it there. It's probably nowhere else. Um, and Catholic modernism, well, you know, we Catholics, it's only in the 20th century. So that's like yesterday. So you can find, you can find that there. So now we're on to number four. Uh, this is those people, philosophers and theologians, who are going to justify the weepers uh, in the audience. And again, I'm giving you a pedigree. Now, as already intimated, there are all kinds of critics of the Enlightenment and secular modernity. Nietzsche, Derrida, and Foucault have already been mentioned as naysayers and as weepers. Yet none of these thinkers who express major grievances advocated for a kind of pure return to the pre-modern state of things, and was certainly not a pre-modern Christian ideational frame that married classical philosophy and Christian revelation. In the first theology course or religious studies course, you probably would find so that marriage is, is constitutive of Christianity. This, see, this still leaves us with a number of anti-moderns uh, from which we can choose, though this is not to say that any one of them would be in agreement with the other. We have Heidegger who carries forward Nietzsche's agenda of getting behind Christian Western civilization in general and both classical philosophy and Christian thought, which are deemed to constitute it. So, we don't like modernity, and we don't like the pre-modern. We must have pre-pre-modern. Reversing the coin, we have Eric Berglund, uh, the political philosopher, who thinks of modern thought, and modern political thought in particular, as a swerve from the Christian and classical past, which can demonstrate its superiority by, by maintaining wonder and transcendence, as well as a sense of a taught in-between character of the finite subject, you are a finite subject, so am I, who cannot attain to perfect knowledge of himself or history or social order, but who will not renounce the responsibilities of always being oriented towards an overdetermined reality, whether being or good or God. And of course, we have Alistair McIntyre, who judges the mutated modernity by the pre-modern standard of Aristotelianism, Thomist world of virtue. 
I promised on this that I would deal with both Martin Heidegger uh, and Alistair McIntyre. I think that sort of is too taxing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with the more familiar of the two. I take that to be, I take the risk, that is Alistair McIntyre. My second and very different example, looks like it's my first example now, but in the original paper is my second one, is Alistair McIntyre, a far more distinguished Irishman than yours truly, and he was also at Notre Dame, so therefore, so if I have, I don't know, glory sort of by association. Since I do not have the luxury of beehive behavior, of bee-like behavior to move from text to text of McIntyre and speak to changes and nuances and inflection, I will be selective. In presenting him, I will stick to after virtue, which is a sensible kind of selection. This is not the worst of strategies. I think it's the best of strategies, as a matter of fact. After virtue is McIntyre's most acclaimed text, and almost everyone would agree that it is a representative text. Now, I'm going to say something so, which I don't think anyone uh, writing about McIntyre has said, and possibly haven't said it because they don't speak Gaelic. So listen, listen to the following. How many people in the audience have touched, I won't say read fully, but have touched, pondered reading after virtue? Okay, all right. That's enough. That's enough. That, that, that will keep me going. One surprising avenue in the text is the epigraph. There's, I think, two epigraphs. Certainly there's one, and there's one in Gaelic. It's the epigraph in Gaelic that stands at the beginning of the text. I've been often amused by it. There's Alistair McIntyre, who kind of is you know, cantankerous like a Scot, you know, but it's, it's written in Irish Gaelic. For the most part, epigraphs are like ornaments. You know, if you open the book, I know sometimes you have to read books. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> to college. So the first page is just a waste of time, right? You've got two names, you've got two quotations, usually two quotations, right? And okay, all right, like, I thought I knew the title of the book anyway, so you're going to flip that. Usually they're supposed to kind of orient you towards that, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. This one's actually extraordinarily interesting, except, of course, it's in a foreign language. So in this case, however, it is not useless. It's not merely an ornament, although one can excuse most commentators for not noticing. In the epigraph, McIntyre speaks of Brish and Lay. Again, you're not understanding that. You probably haven't understood much of what I said thus far. So there's no difference. I've been speaking in Gaelic all along. <laughs> Translated this, however, just, just add Brish. It, see, it sounds so different than, than English. Brish and Lay. Translated, this means daybreak. Now, of course, I have to translate daybreak. Of course, this means dawn after night. Presumably, the night in after virtue is the fundamental theory and practice of modernity with a search for self-certain foundations that renders obsolete practical wisdom and the virtues that make for the good life of the individual and the community. That depends on exemplars of wisdom and virtue. The dawn suggests that there is some capacity in modernity to transcend it, to transcend this night. So, that's about as much happy talk as you're going to get in the text. Now, we'll attest to this capacity momentarily. But, of course, the night ensued the night of modernity. He's a weeper, right? He's, he's not saying nice things about modernity. The night ensued on what was already light. Let's follow the metaphor. Brish on lay might function also to cover the breaking of that day. So you can double up the brish, the breaking. That is, the breaking that is medieval thought, and especially the thought of Aquinas as representing a wisdom discourse, which in turn gets focused in the virtues, and they get exemplified in practices. All of a sudden, it all kind of makes sense. Of course, Aquinas is not fully a standalone figure. He's paired with Aristotle. For McIntyre, whatever else, the medieval world represents something like a consensus point of view in which thought and practice cohere. And that's huge for him because he's making the assumption that in modernity, and for you, and for me, thought and practice don't cohere. All of us are highly functioning schizoids. Modernity, which is characterized by fragmentation and lack of match between theory and practice, breaks this world and breaks with it. McIntyre, whoever refuses to be nostalgic, 
this world, that world back there, cannot entirely be put together again. So Humpty Dumpty is not going to be put together again. The best that can be done in the modern world is the construction of small intentional communities that model themselves, model themselves on the pre-modern world, which, of course, is broken. These local and necessarily small units are the real symbols of resisting the ideological and practical hegemony and authority of modernity. Now, McIntyre's story of pre-modern modernity and limited repair is hardly a new story. It's hardly even a non-familiar story. It's just the best, uh, best-selling version of the story, at least by the standards of the academy. I mean, in some sense, sort of, you know, we, sort of, we all should be Franciscans and bow down, sort of, because if any one of us sells 2,000 copies of a book, I mean, that's a magnificent thing. You can now have, you can now, this will generate even further contempt. Uh, you obviously have some, but this will further, 2,000 copies or 3,000 would be the limit. Now, McIntyre apparently sold about 100,000 copies of Art of Virtue. I really like that, man. Here's the thing, though. I don't think, it's, I don't think enough attention has been paid to it. This story has a number of interestingly odd features. First, while it gels with a lot of Neo-Thomist condemnations of modernity, so Thomists have been doing this thing sort of for 100 years, it differs from Neo-Thomism in two interesting ways. First, if anyone is a fan of Thomas Aquinas, the Aquinas retrieve looks pretty narrow. Yes, the virtues are retrieved. But it seems they seem to be the same ones that one can find in our assaults and comic and ethics. You know, like courage and justice and temperance and prudence. There's not much indication that theological virtues are to be retrieved. So just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, how about faith, hope, and charity? Not much about faith, hope, and charity in terms of the virtues. It's also, it is not clear that belief in God is to be part of the dawn. McIntyre is not obviously convinced by traditional arguments for the existence of God and never makes theological appeals. Nothing, nothing of Aquinas' sacred doctrine, or sacred doctrine, is explicitly taken on board. So what does that mean? Nothing Aquinas says of the Trinity if you're Catholic, the Trinity, is, that's, the Trinity is, is the way in which we figure the Christian, our Christian God. I take it that if you're retrieving Thomas Aquinas, you might also retrieve Christ, because as far as I know, Thomas does believe in Christ and has something to say about him, or the sacraments. It turns out that none of those things are taken on board. And secondly, there is no evidence that the church, as such, survives. None. Not the church. Yes, it is true that Sonny Harwas thinks of churches who took on board this conceptuality, thinks of churches surviving in the modern age and functioning as a critical measure against surrounding and invasive modernity. That is, small churches, Protestant churches, Mennonite churches. Crucially, we would have thought the problem for all of us is how will it go with the actual church to which McIntyre subscribes, the Catholic church? How will it go with that one, that complicated behemoth? We're talking about this behemoth that is the Catholic church with its vast organization, whether we like it or not, its creeds, its uncomfortable moral precepts. Alistair McIntyre then is a weeper without a, without a really sunny side of recovery. Modernity is a deep wound that cannot be fully healed, and that even healing involves jettisoning much of what a standard neothomist would want recovered. And I dare say, if you were a Catholic, you would want recovered. Of course, this leads to the question of whether 
the Christian churches and Christian thinkers have ever taken such a jaundiced view of secular modernity as to provide decent analogues of what one finds in Macintyre. Sticking to Catholicism, one can see in Vatican I, 1870, as in significant respects issuing an all-out condemnation of modernity as plagued by relativism, naturalism, positivism, and atheism. Just in case there wasn't one thing, you're going to get caught sort of in one or other of those. There are a few qualifying clauses. The answer is the church, which will represent a safe haven from the multiple viruses of modernity, all these are viruses. And this line is continued in the encyclical Eternity Patris in 1879 by Leo XIII, in which Aquinas is erected as a thinker of the Catholic Church and received an exclamation point in the anti-modernist ode prescribed by Pius X in 1910. In other words, the only philosopher thinker for the Catholic Church is Thomas Aquinas. So thinking, any thinking that's done outside of that is not thinking Catholicly. If you are a Catholic cheerer of modernity, your hope is that this dark episode is over. And in a real sense, it probably is. Though this is not to say that there is not currently a for the revival of neo-scholastic thought and the setting aside of much 20th century Catholic thought as cowardly compromise. Included here would not only be various socially active forms of Catholicism, represented by Matt, and theologians who and transcendental forms of theology, that is, those people who like Karl Rahner, my friend, and resourceful forms of theology, people like De Lubac and Baudelaire, me, we're all out. Okay, but let's, let's draw a breath. Let's now turn to, um, let's turn to those theoreticians, many philosophers and theologians who provide sophisticated theoretical supports of the most interesting group among you, I'm sorry to say, that is, shadow seers. That is, those of you who think that in some way modernity is a gift in an ambiguous sense that I drew attention to in the beginning of the talk. And as you probably guessed in my tone and now my declaration, I'm elevating this group. So here sort of are the justifications for the shadow seer in modernity. And now we're on to number five. So the talk will not be limitless, but it will be long. Now, there are a number of theoreticizations of modernity being both something of a scourge and a gift. So we have plenty of them. Two of the most intelligent and engaging versions are provided by Charles Taylor and Jacques Derrida. And I spend most of my time here with Taylor. He is by far the, most, the more accessible and works such as a secular age may have acquired coffee table status in the way that none of Derrida's books have. Secular age is about 800 pages. You want to plonk it. Um, you want to fool a friend into thinking you might have read it. And then you even gain greater glory but said you haven't finished it, which might mean that you've read the first paragraph. <laughs> At first brush, in his magnum opus, Taylor seems to be a cheerer of modernity in general, and the Enlightenment in particular. Keeping evaluative comments to a minimum, Taylor tells the story of the Enlightenment in a manner that does not altogether differ from that of Jürgen Habermas as the emergence of freedom and reason, also the emergence of rights and correlative responsibilities. And he's familiar with all the main figures in the emergence, certainly all the English, German, and French literature. And in one way, he's proposing multiple enlightenments and in consequence, either a very complex modernity or multiple modernities. So, the philosophical grammar he exemplifies is broadly Hegelian, a philosopher of the 19th century. This means that modernity is dialectical. You've heard of the word. And by implication, that means, quite simply, translated, means that there's going to be necessarily loss as well as gain. However, it is noticeable that unlike other major 20th century thinkers who deploy a Hegelian grammar or depend upon Hegel, for example, Adorno, Foucault, and even later Derrida, it would be hard to find places where, Tyler, where Taylor chimes in to say that modernity has demonstrated its bankruptcy. We don't have the Enlightenment being condemned as being itself an agent in irrational savagery, for instance, implicated in the Holocaust, as we find with Adorno. Nor do we find the complaint of incoherence such that fate surreptitiously adopts 
reason, and that the commitment to reason itself sometimes turns into blind faith with devastating consequences. Zarida points out, on the one hand, that fundamentalist forms of religion are inflected by reason with respect to their own declarations. You often think of a fundamentalist as someone uh, from a backyard or a boonie uh, who has not sort of been scrubbed clean by modernity. The fact of the matter is fundamentalism is a fundamentally rational option to insist that only this is going to matter and not the rest. It's constructed by modernity. And it's important for you to understand how modernity and life constructs the other. And then we have a complex sort of within modernity, also the both enlightenment and its other. In a famous essay, Faith and Reason, whose title recalls a book by Hegel as well as a famous Hegelian theme, there that points out on the one hand, as I said, that fundamentalist forms of religion are inflected by reason with respect to their own declarations and demonstrate their dependence on modern technical reason in the very expressions of outrage against reason. Think of the terrorist. Terrorist depends upon bombs. Terrorist depends upon the internet. We're thinking of terrorism again, sort of is the primitive, unwashed, uh, ill-organized. The terrorist is the hyper-organized, um, the hyper-computer literate and encrypted, and, uh, and the hyper-techno. That's the terrorist. The terrorist is a construction of modernity. Modernity creates sort of its own opposite, its own other. But there it is, seems, to be den seems to be denying that, that Taylor leaves open is irrationality continues to exist because reason simply has not mastered it. Derrida is refusing that. That's not the way to think about things. For Derrida, it is modern reason which has dialectically created the fundamentalist forms of faith and, of course, the practical consequences. Now, this is not to say that in this huge book that Taylor does no weeping. The weeping, however, is gentle. A violin rather than a percussion section in a vast orchestra, orchestral presentation. Taylor is convinced that it's impossible for the Enlightenment not to produce some psychological, physical, and social damage as it wrests people away from the comfort of the belief system and established authorities. And in due course, he recognizes that it's going to put its ugly handprint on nature and that it's going to cause the emergence of individualism, rampant individual, which ends up ravaging communities. So he kind of has an acknowledgment that some bad things will happen to good people, all of us. The question is of how and from where. The sources of correction, he's looking then, we have to correct these things in modernity, he says. But the sources of correction are not to be found in, on, in any unambiguous way in Christianity. Christianity is wounded, maybe mortally, but wounded seriously by modernity and has not recovered from its wounds. Instead, the sources of, and the healing of the Enlightenment are to be found in such movements, which probably you only heard sort of in history courses, in Romanticism and Idealism basically the end of 18th century, 19th century phenomena. This is not surprising. So, in other words, for the moment, you don't need to understand what they are. All you need to understand is they're not necessarily Christian. The reason that he picks these and not Christianity is not hard to find. These are cures that happen within the imminent frame and are consistent with it. As a philosophical genealogist, that is a storyteller of modernity, Keller is descriptive rather than prescriptive. Romanticism, back, let's say, in the early 1800s with idealism, helped by elaborating forms of knowing, the sense of, this happens in poetry, just think of William Wordsworth, the sense of the aliveness of nature that resists reducing it to inert matter, and the sense of the importance of community to counter the anonymity of individuals in society. So, of course, Christianity could do all of that, but what is permitted? Christianity is not going to be the one that's carrying that solution. Some other things in modernity will carry that. That's the main point. Still, neither of these discourses, Romanticism and Idealism, uh, which have various inflections, oblige one. Here's the good thing. They're going to be cures. But they don't oblige you to do any of the following. They don't oblige you, happy news for you, 
They don't oblige you to believe in a transcendent God. They don't oblige you to adhere to the supernatural. They don't oblige you to subscribe to a definite creed, the articles of a particular confession, or encourage you, demand of you, that you obey particular Christian moral precepts. That's a good deal. You got a cure and you have nothing to do. The Enlightenment requires correction for the fundamental dismantling of the architecture of the pre-modern world which has happened and replaced by another, what Taylor calls the imminent frame, is not going to be called back. It has happened and does not look like there's going to be a fundamental cure. It is within this imminent frame, without a transcendent God, without a God sort of who's going to command us. It's without sort of the notion of supernatural. It's within the frame without these things in which we, you and I, live, move, and have our being. Taylor speaks of this so casually and reasonably. Probably in your own life when you're not reading a book, when someone talks casually and believably, and believably you're suspicious, when you, work, when you find in the book you're not, transfer some of the suspicion to someone who talks casually and easily and believably. Obviously something bad is happening and you just don't quite know it. So he speaks so casually and reasonably that we don't feel the claustrophobia of all of it. His prognostications with respect to mainline forms of Christianity seem to suggest that he cannot imagine a return to the pre-modern horizon. As a Catholic, and he is a Catholic, he does seem to experience the pathos of the emptying of the churches. This happened in his beloved Quebec in the 60s and 70s, and is a parallel to currently what is happening in Ireland. He is not apocalyptic about the future of the church. It's just that, and again, I'm breathing, performing how I think he thinks. It's just that the church is, again, being reasonable, We'll have to deal with modernity, characterized by secular reason, but a reason which now happily has inbuilt corrections, which ironically allow it to increase its power. Traditional Christianity in its many forms can try to resist, but more than likely in the interest of survival, they will be forced to adapt. I'm sure some of you have thought of this too. Since Taylor does not evaluate, we don't know how he judges the compromises that have to be made. But let me underscore the following about what Taylor is saying, although not in his own words, but more nearly in the vocabulary of Marxism and the late Derrida. Modernity, enlightenment, and its corrections, romanticism and idealism, is a closed system which permits and excludes various forms of thinking and practice by maintaining itself in the self-corrective process that resembles that of self-immunization from transcendence. Modernity has that feature. It complicates itself. It also has, it creates this other. But the one thing it would not allow back into the frame is another other. So we can have substitute of surrogates for God and what God would have done but we're going to have to find them elsewhere. Either I as a creator genius, obvious to you, or you as a community, equally obvious to you, uh, will be the surrogates with respect sort of, to what transcendence once upon a time did, so there's no in this notion so that there is a transcendent and triune God. Now, as we've allowed Taylor the floor, and we have allowed him the floor, as the preeminent philosoph philosophical justifier of the shadow seer, albeit the shadow seer that's also something of a pragmatist, Given about my own hybrid nature and my Christian elective affinities, I feel compelled to ask, are there any equally distinguished theological shadow seers? Actually, and here, if you go down 5-2, got quite a few. Got Pope Francis, Pope Benedict XVI, and Johann Baptist Mest. We'll talk about all those for a moment. So, I think we've got quite a few. Let me restrict myself for the moment to Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI. Now, Francis is hardly, I remind you, our current pope, just in case, is hardly a net declaimer of modernity and shows no signs of being willing to roll back human rights, uh, modern concerns for human dignity and justice and so forth. 
But as is well known, he decries untutored capitalism, the catastrophic damage done to nature in and through the modern industrial progress, and the destruction of society consequent on the acquisitive mentality spawned in and by modernity. What he recommends, however, is the basic charisma of the gospel rather than the church or the developed theological edifices generated within the history of Christianity. While hardly despising theological construction, we don't find in Francis any nostalgia for the pre-modern world of Thomistic synthesis. Thus, I suppose, the backlash from Catholic conservatives. For Francis, the gospel is both persuasive and light enough to carry Christians through and beyond secular modernity. Now, Benedict says many of the things that we identify Francis with and said them before him. Yet it is fair to say the following three things which distinguish him. It is true, one, that Benedict is more concerned with the identity of the church, of the church its authority, and its teaching. Two, while Benedict is willing to ascribe value to modernity, his critique is broader in that it includes a critique of secular culture as an ideological system which functions hegemonically. And it's deeper in that he brings out the antipathy of secular modernity for religion. You might think that's sort of a slight thing. But secular modernity suggests of itself it's neutral, has nothing against religion. It allows it. Uh, it just simply will not allow sort of no one religion so to mash or smash another religion. Benedict does not believe it. He thinks that the neutrality of the modern world is armed against religion. It's biased against it. And third, although Benedict does not think that pre-modern Christianity can be re retrieved whole scale, he does think not only that significant elements can survive, but ought to survive under pain of nominalism. In other words, if you're going to have a Catholic church in the 21st century that is at least analogous to the Catholic church in the first century, there can't be zero properties in common. There can't be one property in common. There have to be multiple properties in common. We can't decide beforehand just how many. We can't decide beforehand what they're going to look like. But his view is that Catholic Christianity is a thick form of religion. And some things so that's as vacuous as, from his point of view, which any good moral person can sort of uh, sign on to as, well, uh, Catholic Christians are for human rights. Well, so is Miss America. <laughs> which might reveal sort of that there are many ways in which we find in the modern world to say something we think is important and avoid saying anything at all. Now, equally here, one could deduce a number of modes of liberation theology, but also Johann Baptist Metz. It would be good to fill out both here, but for economy's sake, however, I'll stick to saying a few words about Johann Baptist Metz. And here, confessedly, I'm largely pandering to Matt Egmar. Metz, who is influenced by critical theory as much as Karl Rahner, has over a lifetime engaged theological production, uh, has critiqued secular modernity for the way in which and here are the sins. The way in which it fosters historical amnesia of how history has turned out for considerable groups of people. Groups of people for the moment now, not just you or me. But the fact that you're listening to this lecture here, whether compelled or sort of an act of freedom, means you're already fairly privileged. And I'm extremely privileged to be giving this lecture. So it fosters historical amnesia of how history turned out for considerable groups of people. Secondly, moral apathy regarding the claim the suffering has on us, if it has on us anything at all. And also the ideology of endless progress, which sidelines critical scrutiny of the winners and losers in the so-called progress. Metz, however, provides a reflective version, justification of the shadow seer, rather than the weeper. We can see this by attending to two absences in his thought. He does not absolutely decry modern reason, but condemns what he regards as its dark side. And secondly, 
His work illustrates no penchant for returning to a pre-modern legislative and clerical church and a theology-heavy Christian conceptuality. Crucial for the opposing of amnesia, apathy, and dispelling the vacancy of the modern ideal of progress is the recall of the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. This is restorative of the devastated subject of history, such, such restoration being the central task of the church, founded on the essential Christian message that is at a slant to modernity and apocalyptically interruptive with respect to it. You'll probably come to the conclusion that I'm far more attracted to genealogists or shadow seer of persuasion than others. They seem less hysterical. In addition, they show great variety. For while there's a mixture of affirmation and negation, there is sometimes more cheering than weeping and vice versa. Before I go, I'm like the person in Jacobean tragedy. I've just been stabbed and I'm just about to go, but it takes me a long time to get off the stage. So my, my exit, I think, is going to be a Jacobean tragedy version, although the tragedy may more nearly be on you. Before I go, perhaps I have time, but of course I'm the master of time here. I have time to say a word about two more of these constructors, two more of these theologian shadow seers. And these are hans Urs von Badesar and Henri de Lubeck. And the choice of these Catholic genealogists of modernity serve four interests in increasing order of importance. There will be an irony here. First, I've devoted a lot of time recently to both, especially Balthasar, so I'm entitled to get something out of it. It's my party and I can cry if I want to. B, discussing them, however, briefly adds to variety to my account uh, of genealogies favoring shadow seers. And three, increases the theological quotient, which may be slightly, have been slightly, I think, uh, overcome by the philosophical. And finally, finally and most importantly, we can bring out more interesting and more clearly interesting relations to the kind of view of healing internal to modernity to which Taylor brings attention. Remember what I said. It is a cure. The cure is not going to be provided by Christianity. It will be internal to modernity itself. Famous as Nouvelle Theologie theologians, that's New Theology theologians, doesn't sound so good now these days. The French always sounds better, you know. Nouvelle Theologie. Okay, I could, I could swagger with it, but New Theologians doesn't sound quite as good. But in any case, over a course of over 50 years of writing, the Lubach and Balthasar drew attention to the modernity that had unrung the integral world of the medieval period, and of course also put in its wake the hapless nature of Christianity's response, and in particular that of the Catholic Church. Pretty hapless. Neither was a net weeper regarding modernity. Both welcomed the greater dialogical spirit of modernity, and both embraced large swaths of modern culture. But there was much in modernity that was askew, and much that was implicitly and explicitly hostile to Christianity, and that nothing was to be gained by ignoring it. For both of them, the world was both world and world. You wonder what that means. This meant in both cases a kind of Augustinian comportment towards the world. The world was good enough such that it should come as no surprise that one could learn and benefit from it. At the same time, the world was sufficiently distorted, sufficiently world, in the sense we get sort of in John's Gospel, that one should not entirely cast aside suspicion or be unaware of the prospects of being co-opted by the secular. Both the Lubach and Balthasar lent their voice to this necessary balance in the post-conciliar age. In addition, both have a thicker view of the church that is to be saved from modernity than that of Metz and are far more prescriptive and normative regarding the identity of the church. This means that the survival of the church is much more in doubt since purely accommodating forms of the church would and will not count. To speak of the survival of the church is to speak to the survival of a church that has a hierarchical structure, possesses a creed, is confident in its declaration of the precept, concerned with justice, but not afraid to speak to the afterlife. The church is also ecumenical and multiply inflected in terms of spirituality, since tradition represents many takes on the fundamental mystery of the incarnation. Nothing like a return 
of the neopatristic synthesis is imagined, the homocent is imagined in the future, since its value is the past, but considerable, it's also relative. Now, perhaps the most interesting thing, and I am moving towards the end, about two longish paragraphs to go. Perhaps the most interesting thing about both of these theologians is the extent to which, when they've been critical of modernity, they seem to concentrate the criticisms, this is interesting, not on Enlightenment modernity, or what we might call modernity in this first phase, but on those systems of thought and practice that might conceivably be thought of as secure, that is, modernity in the second phase. In the case of the Lubeck, this meant, on the one hand, the critique of Marxist dialectical materialism, but also the entire gamut of 19th century uh, forms of French socialism, and on the other, Nietzsche and his vitalist associates. In the case of Balthasar, the attack against post-enlightenment forms of modernity has a more significant range, at the same time be more focused against German idealism and romanticism, which are identified by Taylor. I'm speaking very generally here, but of course, I'm doing that throughout. There are a lot of niceties, but I think all of them can wait. The point I want to make involves recurring to Taylor. Recall that for Taylor, idealism and romanticism are best understood as providing cures for the overreach of reason and damage to self, nature, and society. This means that modernity has, as, as a whole is self-adjusting and is self-correcting. For the Lubach and Balthasar, this means that modernity is self-validating and represents an immunization against transcendence breaking in, obedience rather than autonomy coming to be valorized. To accept them is to accept that the prospect for Christianity, indeed any religion which involves a transcendent God, are essentially nil. Moreover, whereas the form, whereas the Enlightenment either represents a critique of Christianity or presents a hollowed out moral form, Romanticism and idealism look sufficiently like Christianity to be at least compatible with it. There is the ever-present danger that they can be mistaken for it. They are seducing counterfeits of the real thing. And now my closing remarks. I've taken you on both a personal, I made objectionable remarks about you, historical, and contemporary tour this evening of reactions to and justifications of yea saying, nay saying, and yea and nay saying regarding modernity. Particularly, I've attempted a crude excavation of your pre-reflective tendencies towards cheering, weeping, or alternating cheering and weeping regarding the modernity, which is the air you breathe. In addition, I've run through modern ideological constructions that seem to justify one of these three reactions or dispositions. I tried to have a double register with respect to this. With regard to philosophers, Habermas vindicated cheering, Heidegger, but especially McIntyre vindicated weeping, and Taylor vindicated cheering and weeping, or the halting between. With regard to theologians, we pointed to liberal Protestant theology and Catholic modernism as vindicating cheering, to Vatican I, anti-modernism, and forms of neo-scholasticism as vindicating weeping. And theologians as different as Francis and Benedict, Metz, the Lubach, and Baudelaire, as favoring a balance of cheering and weeping, with on balance a bit more weeping than cheering. And as you have probably guessed, I'm giving a favorable nod to philosophers and theologians who justify the reactions of the third kind, that is, the reactions of the shadow seers. I simply think they were likely to get further with a genealogy that justifies a response respectful of ambiguity and which accordingly would show some measure of ambivalence. Perhaps it is, however, only when we get here to this particular point that the real choosing begins. Taylor is a somewhat sanguine philosophical vindicator of shadow seeing. He might be aided by listening more to weepers such as Heidegger and McIntyre and might be made better by being supplemented by Derrida. And though well disposed towards Catholicism, there is not a great deal of alarm or pathos in the secular age concerning its identity or the prospects of its demise. 
Taylor tends to fall back on the functional historicism to tell you the story, but he won't intervene in the story. In contrast, the ambivalence of all of our theological supporters of modernity cuts deeply, our shadow seers. While they all support, all support both cheering and weeping, but prefer proportionally more weeping than cheering. And I tend to think they got it right. But this is just the beginning. Benedict XVI, Johann Baptist Metz, Olga de Lubach and Hansel von Balthasar grasp the doubleness of the gift of modernity. But of course, they do not cheer for the same thing, weep for the same thing, and hope for the same thing. I think once we get to them, we have finally arrived at the right question. But I hope but I hope this question, which we're not, which we haven't actually asked, is the question that we eventually uh, will arrive at. So what I've done sort of is I've made a ladder and now I'm kicking it away. But at least I think I needed to bring you up the ladder. And if the ladder was nothing, then I promise you I will lay down and weep by the waters of Babylon or at least any sort of river I can make my way to. Good evening. Thank you. So I will take some questions. Probably what happens, I think, is that you, you might have a variety. I mean, the purest form sort of, of, let's say, cheering and weeping is that you just have different sort of selective attentions, different phenomena sort of come into view. It's very difficult sort of, you know, for anyone sort of to be pure anything because the greatest cheer is sort of will somehow or other, uh, the immunized life will get disturbed by something or other, in which case then sort of that um, he or she will have to add sort of, not just simply stay sort of you know, on, on message, but will somehow or other have to offer a refutation uh, or will have to put down sort of something which seems sort of to uh, challenge the position. So I think that happens sort of almost at, almost at an unconscious level. The pure form is uh, you select your reality and you cheer sort of you know, or um, you weep accordingly. Or sort of you know you somehow or other sort of found weeping sort of and sort of cheering. But it's quite clear that it's very difficult to separate out pre-reflective from reflective. I mean, you're a young student here. Um, what I mean by pre-reflective is what's the natural default, what's your natural affect, and what's the natural judgment you're going to make um, if someone says, well, you know, uh, the modern world sucks. I mean, I'm trying to figure out sort of in what way some of the graduates speak. They'll probably speak as roughly as that, if not worse. Um, so so let's, assume, let's assume sort of it's that. Let, let's assume you're not talking sort of about sort of the wonderful class you had in history, or theology, or philosophy. It's really as basic as that. What I want to say is that almost everyone will have some assumptive set that they haven't arrived at by reason. We would say back in Ireland that the various things that we have as default, we picked up on the side of the road. Picked up the side of the road means that they're just, we just happen to have them in our back pocket. This is actually, we just pick it out, and that's actually what we're saying. So when I, when I said all of us are living and breathing in modernity, that means that all of us have a whole vocabulary of these things which are ready at hand. But you're at college, so you're probably not going to be a pure type. Some of those things which intuitively you might sort of, if you were going to be a cheerer, so you point out sort of you know, how, the, how economy, sort of, you know, how health and all that is going better, um, well, you might actually have reflected on that. You might even be able to give arguments on that because that's what the college does. So you yourself might look like someone like Habermas. You might be able to offer arguments which look like that. Or they're half arguments. They're half baked on, but they're, but they're arguments nonetheless. But if you make arguments on something behalf, you're arguing against something. So that probably we slide between the pre-reflective and the reflective pretty much, at least to the degree to which so that you're going to be college educated. If you're not college educated, it's more likely that you're going to be operating almost entirely on the pre-reflective level. But you probably are not. But you can imagine yourself doing it because if this is not you now, you can, you can imagine what were you like sort of, you know, when you were a sophomore in high school. What kind of things did you have in your back pocket? What sort of was that instant reaction? Did you want to be sort of one of the cool bad boys 
who thought everything about sort of the modern world was terrible. You didn't know what you were saying, but uh, you know, nonetheless, you wanted to be part of that minority, right? So, but there are arguments available. There's, you could still put those in your back pocket, right? Now, of course, you can argue that. You could say, hey, um, I'm taking this uh, really cool course sort of, you know, on uh, Foucault, right? I'm taking this cool course on Foucault. And Foucault sort of you know, is a sneer at modernity. Of course, he uses it all the time, but he's a net sneerer. So sometimes education is really about the sneering that we end up finding justification for, right? <laughs> I'm probably dismantling all educational theory here, but um, so put it this way. It does seem to me there are many good reasons why we, myself as well as a professor, no Dame professor, and pretty heavily into education and so forth, uh, and not accidentally. But it is the case, though. I mean, if I'm being real, I have a son, uh, you know, your age. Um, he's not, I mean, he pretends to be interested in the truth, and he will be interested in the truth. But he's interested in sounding good. You know, so you can be a, you can be a bad boy sort of in your behavior. You can also be a bad boy intellectually or reflectively too. So not all negatives are like that, but you can actually make, make a negative like that. The French, one of the things that uh, Habermas thinks about the French, though he's not, he doesn't really have this rapier-like wit, so he can say it is. He does say nasty things about them, like the second raters, or depend upon the Germans and all the rest of this stuff. Um, but what he doesn't say is that a lot of intellectual thinking is a form of posing, right? Or it can be a form of posing. So just to get back to the point, the levels of reflection, pre-reflection and reflection, I think while, of course, what I did is I... I wanted to make sure that without this apparatus of you knowing sort of uh, Charles Taylor or you knowing Jürgen Habermas or Jacques Derrida or Heidegger or even Alison McIntyre, you could understand what we're talking about. Because I do think that however high the level of reflection that theologian philosophers, however high the reflection is going to be and necessarily is going to be, because after all, that's going to be an argument of the space. So you have to, like a game of chess, you have to assume that everything you say is going to be countered by someone else. So you, often I, I imagine sort of that students in that class are saying, why is the professor using relative causes? Uh, wasn't I told in high school, so there's no subject, verb, object, it's declarative sentence, what in the hell is going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. Here's a secret. The kind of sentences had to be hard earned because for every declaration there's a count, there is an infinity of counter declarations which a declaration should be able to take counter beforehand. So the same thing here. Nonetheless, I think my task was to give you a sense of what your reactions are, but sometimes you, but sometimes, I'm sure not every argument that you've given pro or con, respect to modernity, however you got off in that topic, whether drink was or was not involved. That those particular, those particular arguments, that, you, that those arguments are going on for the last 300 years. Something happens, and then sort of we're asked to say yay or nay. Or sometimes we feel we have to say yay or nay. Or as matters of public policy, we have to say yay or nay. So let's take sort of Pope Francis, uh, because he speaks sort of more simply than all the theologians and the fossils put together. So let's say his particular view sort of you know, on the environment. He keeps that sort of at a, at a pretty low level in some ways, right? Beautifully open low level, but it's, it's low level. It's, 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 there's not, nothing terribly opaque or erudite about it. Let's just got to do so fundamental thing about sort of stewardship of the earth. Well, Okay, that's nice, but if you're not pledging to live in a schizophrenic world of where that uh, I'm, fully, I'm fully open to capitalism, I'm fully open so, to making sort of a buck no matter what, you can't be that and then subscribe to that, which of course we often do. So reflection sort of is that area in which the comfort of us sort of being in two places at the one time and being totally contradictory, that game is over. You've got to decide. These guys decide. They decided, they decided there's plenty of evidence not to be a cheerer. Habermas decides to be a cheerer. 
plenty of evidence not to be a weeper. There's some cheering. Um, McIntyre decides to be a weeper. Plenty of evidence so that you could have one or the other and not to decide for both, but Taylor does, and then the theologians do too. Thinking is, um, finally, you've got sort of two. Not to have a unified theory of the world, but somehow or other, there's some kind of consistency with respect to what, sort of, what is the case? What do I want to be the case? And I can't actually have two contrary views at the same time. Right? Because pretty effectively, sometimes we have, even though I suggested that sometimes we have sort of pure, we're going purely in one direction, probably so that we, as usual, we're a mess and melange of various things. But the reflection is that, I mean, I said just to keep you, keep you here sort of a little bit longer than you would like to. I said in the beginning that I'm providing you with a venerable pedigree sort of, you know, of presumptions or prejudice you might have had anyway. Well, I came through on that in some way. But in another way, I think what I'm, I'm advising is that the world we live in, I'd, lo I'd love to tell you it's not complicated. I'd love, to, I'd love to bring you back to a simpler world. Your world, your world is more complicated than mine. And all our, all our world is more complicated than we would like it to be. But that doesn't get you off the hook. You pull back so there's no in directions of, I, I go the way so there's of autonomy, of freedom, and I go the way so there's of cheering. It's all, all fantastic and so forth. Until, of course, it isn't fantastic or isn't fantastic for you anymore. Um, so we've got to get a handle on what we've left behind what we've gained, and what we might regain sort of now in a different form. We gain a different form, but it isn't the case that I or Regan can say for you, or even for myself, oh, I want to regain this other thing which we left behind and add it to all these fine things. There has to be some problem with this so-called fine thing of modernity in order for me to have any interest and motivation in recovering, let's say, something like sort of a, a way of living with the environment, sort of which was more nearly there before the Industrial Revolution. Or somehow or other, a community worked a lot better than it does now, where sort of you know, our relationships are almost all contractual. Where are even the sexual relationships of you students are contractual. You hook up. It's a capitalization. I mean, I'm, I'm not, not a moralist. I'm not a priest. I'm not going to. I'm no more. There's no morality here. I have no idea what my son is doing at the moment. <laughs> but I would like you to reflect not 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 about not about morality here, but like, what does it mean? I, I mentioned sort of at one particular point the modern world introduces a split between sort of you know, body uh, and body and spirit, or body and intellect, and so forth. So that one part of you sort of you know, is hyper rational. And then the compensatory feature is what? You're too busy. You're too busy to do the hard work, the hard, messy work uh, of dealing with another human being who only idolizes you every other day. So I think, I think that, that's interesting that even the way it's not got to do with parents telling you what you should do. It's got to do with how come that, that becomes a particular form of life. Question in the back. The initial thing was that we don't want to give the shadow seers, let's say, the unreflective level. Just simply, that's the way, you could even say, that's the way they're programmed. You know, that cheerers are going on around and sometimes they feel, oh, no, that, can't, that, that just isn't right, or weepers around, that can't be right either. So it's already a kind of intuitive feeling, so that, you know, we got great things. Whether they can name those things, they, they could, you could force them to name them, but if you don't force them, they will not name them. But they're also going to name, but. You know, that word, that word but, which we all use, you, there are plenty of buts sort of, you know, in sort of you know, this, um, but just think about how we use the word but. We don't reflect on the but. I mean, you might, you might sort of think, of, well, I'm writing sort of you know, on Jane Austen or some of that, and you, well, you know, uh, Jane Austen's novel sort of you know, have got to do sort of you know, with gender relations sort of you know, in the 1800s and so forth, but something else, you might want to say something. But beyond that, beneath that level, the common garden level. The genius of human beings is, but they don't listen to the but. They sometimes say, well, yeah, that's great, but so it's, it's a weak but. It's just enough refusal that that can't be fully true. They may or may not fill it out. I'm saying that happens all the time. I'm saying that happens all the time. And even if sort of someone sort of is bellicose 
and is shouting at you so they've never used to believe this or that and so forth. And you can see, but really you're saying but. I want to say there's also high theoretical forms of that but, which are fully elaborated. They're not mild, they're highly articulate, um, and they try sort of to do, in a sense, I won't say a, a kind of business school cost-benefit analysis, but just, see, but just look, acknowledge, don't be unreal about uh, what modernity has given you. So I came from South Bend early this morning, really bumpy ride from Detroit to Boston, regretting, regretting coming, momentarily, sorry. Um, I got here and I gave a talk and I'll go back tomorrow. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the horse wouldn't have got me here on time. We can't be stupid. But when we stop being stupid, does that mean then we stop being critical? I don't think we, sh I don't think we should, or we can. And I don't think sort of if you are really a thinker, you could ever sort of give a carte blanche with respect to the modeled, beautiful, and sometimes intensely ugly world that we live in. I'll put it this way. Um, on the description that you provided, sort of, it seems to me that the real entity you're talking about sort of is a shadow seer. That is, that you would find it difficult to imagine that someone sort of could intuitively sort of be a cheer all the way down and all the way across. My point was that while you, and to some extent myself, since I occupy sort of the shadow, shadow seer role, I myself can't project myself outward in such a way that I can be a cheerer. But I've heard plenty of them. And whether or not I construct them as apologists you know, for capitalism or whatever, either, at least on the reflective level, they're saying things they don't believe, or perhaps even worse, they are saying things they believe. And then I have to imagine how on earth could they believe them? So your response is, how could they believe them? Do they actually believe them? Well, but that's because you're probably at least a shadow seer. I think we might have to call it. It's up to, I mean, I'll talk endlessly, uh, but. Uh, if you have further questions, you can come up. Okay, all right.